Hi everybody, this is Mary, as you know, and um, we are gonna tackle the third part of the codependency. We've looked at um, behavior and we've looked at developmental issues like attachment styles. Now we're gonna turn our attention to the physiology of and the immune system damage of codependency. Now I am learning to use Zoom, and the reason I'm using Zoom for this particular section is because it's dense, and I'm gonna have three different sections of this topic, okay? And so I'm gonna to need to look at the PowerPoint at the same time as I'm talking to you, and I'm gonna show you uh, the PowerPoint. Now, it, it is also in your book, but, um, <clears throat> and so I feel badly if I'm reading it to you, but um, I feel like because the material is a little bit harder, um, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way, okay? So let me do screen share, and let's take a look. We're going to start with, uh, again, the beginning, which is part three, the physiology of the stress response um, connected to codependency. And... We'll go, we'll remind ourselves of the debt, this part of the definition, you know, ultimately, right? Codependency is a chronic stress disease, which can devastate our immune system and lead to systemic and even life-threatening illnesses. So this is the heart of the matter for me, because when you do your genograms, you'll see times the addict, actually, the alcoholic outlives the support person. And this is why. Um, while attachment issues set the emotional and developmental stage for future behaviors, the fight, flight, or freeze response is the physical mechanism that leads to our um, physical deterioration and actually um, lowers our immune system. And so um, if you think about it, the fight, flight, or freeze response was designed to help us run away from the tiger to deal with an emergency. However, what we're talking about with um, attachment disruption and then relationship with someone who is unavailable um, or unpredictable is you have this constant uh, triggering of this part of this uh, emotional part of us. So let's take a look at the attachment implications in developing chronic illness. There's actually uh, research around this and there's uh, in attachment insecurity does lead to increased risk of disease. Uh, one, you, there's an increased susceptibility to stress Anxious and avoidant codependents struggle with emotional regulation, sorry, and reactivity. And even if it's only internal, we often find ourselves in stressful interpersonal relationships that can trigger our overwhelming physical flooding. The flooding is kind of like putting your foot on the accelerator. Increased use of external regulators of affect. So anxious people will engage in stressful interpersonal attempts to self-soothe, right? which means, you remember in that, um, when we're looking at how adults manifest this, how they get anxious, and then they try even harder to make the person engage. In fact, they're trying so hard to make the person engage, they forget why they were even anxious to begin with, all right? The other thing they might do is turn to uh, drugs and alcohol, or some sort of porn, or something to manage their anxiety if they can't get the other person to do it. Avoiding codependents are more vulnerable, again, to using substances, work, isolation because you know we down regulate so when people get stressed and whoop close it down we don't reach out we we go we let go now altered help seeping behavior anxious codependents will overuse medical professionals and others in an attempt to engage the stress that seems to flood them and it feels out of control with them. So um, this makes them vulnerable to medication use, to be, you know, to ordering rando things on the internet, you know, stuff to kind of help them calm down. Um, so they tend to be a little more gullible to suggestions of things they should take. Uh, avoiding codependents are less likely to seek help and allow themselves to become more acutely ill. And so if we won't get help until we're so sick we have to, instead of heading it off early on. Attachment insecurity contributes to physical illness through increased susceptibility to stress. Uh, isolation can affect our physical health. For example, um, well-designed studies have shown that a small social network or inadequate emotional support is associated with a threefold increase in subsequent cardiac events among patients who've already had a heart attack. 
and a two to threefold increase of future coronary artery disease among healthy patients. In fact, Robert Sapowski's found that the um, effect of social support on life expectancy may be as strong as the effects of obesity, cigarette smoking, hypertension, or level of activity. You may have seen the research that connects loneliness uh, equal to uh, 15 cigarettes. Okay, so it's extremely bad for us, which is why during the coronavirus, which is why I'm talking to you this way, instead of with you, you have a per, per, uh, part of the population that's extremely vulnerable. And what I'm seeing is people who use other people to self-soothe are struggling hard because, um, you know, the anxiety that goes with not being able to connect um, is particularly painful if you're an anxious codependent. I mean, nobody likes it. I mean, I, I'm avoidant, but I really miss hugging my sponsor. But she's 85. And so I can't see her right now. We talk all the time, but I hate it. I absolutely hate it. But it doesn't necessarily increase my anxiety the way it does other people that I know. All right, I wanted to introduce you to something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Uh, this is a very well-known study. Um, I also make reference to it in your book um, on page um, 129 and 30. Uh, it's a study that shows a clear scientific link between the many types of childhood adversity and the adult onset of physical disease and mental health disorders. And on page 131, I actually put the questions on the questionnaire in there for you. Um, but in general, the questions uh, look at things like childhood experience of verbal put downs, humiliation, emotionally, physically neglected. Uh, physically and sexually abused, living with a depressed parent or parent with mental illness or parent addicted to alcohol and drugs, witnessing a mother being abused or even losing a parent to separation and divorce. So um, uh, the key is for all of those things that they are scary and unpredictable stressors. Okay, one of the reasons, again, this cor coronavirus has been so particularly difficult is because it happens so quickly. So we didn't have any preparation. We could put some things in place. Boom, suddenly the curtain's drawn. So it's hard. Uh, 17,000 people took this particular ACE uh, questionnaire to help the researchers understand how childhood events, events might affect uh, adult health. What they were trying to look at is figuring out uh, which people in Kaiser were kind of um, higher level medical users, using more medical services, and trying to figure out who those people were and, and some underlying uh, connections, okay? And so the patients leading and a survey were not troubled or disadvantaged. The average patient was 57, three quarter were college educated, successful men and women with good educations, mostly white, middle class health benefits, and stable jobs. This is back before um, we had affordable care. So if you had Kaiser insurance, you were probably employed. 64% answered yes to one or more categories. 87% of those who answered yes to one question actually went on to say yes to others. 40% uh, had experienced two or more categories. 12.5 had an A score of four or more. And then one third had a score of zero, which I thought was interesting. Now the key is the number of categories ACE patients encountered would by and large predict how much medical care they would require in adulthood. So the higher your ACE score, the higher the number of doctor visits you've had in the past year, and the higher the number of unexplained health symptoms. And the key is unexplained because that would indicate it may be systemic, okay? People with a score of four or more were twice as likely to be diagnosed with cancer as someone with a zero. For each A score an individual had, there was a chance of being hospitalized with an autoimmune disease in adulthood, like something like lupus, okay? Uh, and it rose by 20%. Someone with an A score of four was 400% more likely to be facing depression than someone with a score of zero. An A score of six or more uh, you shortened an individual's lifespan by almost 20 years. This is incredibly important, okay? Early childhood stressors begin, right, a hyperarousal system that literally can shorten our lifespan. 
Now, these type of chronic adversities change the architecture of our brain, altering the expression of genes that actually control our stress hormone output and trigger an overactive inflammatory stress process for life and predisposing uh, the child to adult disease. Scientists at Duke, UC San Francisco, and Brown have shown that childhood adversity actually damages us at a cellular level in a way that prematurely ages ourselves and affects our longevity. Adults who faced early life stressors show a greater erosion in telomeres, the protective caps that sit on the strands of DNA that keep our DNA strands connected. Um, as they erode, we're more likely to develop disease and age faster. So they normally erode with age. What stress does is speed up the aging process. Now there's something called the theory of everything. The immune system is the body's master operating control system. So what happens in the brain in childhood uh, sets up a lifelong programming for this master operating system that covers everything, the mind, uh, the body, and the brain. The unifying principle of this new theory of everything is this. Your emotional biography becomes your physical biology. And together, they write the script for much of how you will live your life. Our findings show that the 10 different types of adversity we examined were almost equal in their damage, says Felitti. And this was true even though some types, like sexual abuse, are more shameful in our society. I found this so interesting that in fact, when you looked at those 10 areas, somebody goes to prison or a divorce, equal in damage to um, uh, emotional humiliation, for example, okay? So the truth is, um, all of those things create um, a hyper response in our bodies. Now let's take a look at our normal stress response. Stephen Porges writes in his polyvagal theory about the importance of autonomic systems and our vent ventral vagal complex to the regulation of emotion. So the vagus nerve, and I mentioned this before in class, it's a primary nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system. It helps us self-regulate, helps us seek and use others to help us regulate, engages uh, engaging other people. It's also the rest and recuperate, rest and relax part of our, um, of our stimulation system, okay? And remember that the vagus nerve goes from your amygdala all the way down to your gut and then goes up to your frontal lobe. Porges suggests that human beings have involved a hierarchical, organized series of response to threat in what is, in fact, the third but highest level of response, most evolved and newest, the organism engages in the ventral vagal system. So it's responsible for signaling others in the environment regarding movement and emotion through its control over facial expressions and vocalization. So what happens is in our frontal lobe system, right? And in our, we were able to, when we get uh, afraid, use our, our words, our facial expression, body, to engage other people. Uh-oh, uh-oh, and allow them to become part of our self-soothing mechanism. When this strategy fails, we then revert to an older system, the sympathetic nervous system, which then mobilizes fight or flight, uh-oh, okay? And if that, and so that way we get to either we go toward it or we run away from it. And if that doesn't work, he says, then we go back to our earliest, which is the dorsal vagal system, which is in the, in the brain stem. And that's when you get immobilized and you freeze, okay? And some people even feign death, they pass out, okay? But a lot of us just freeze and dissociate. So let's say you're lying in bed and everyone else in the house is asleep. It's 1 a.m., you hear a creak on the steps, then there's another creak, and now it sounds like there's someone in the hallway. You feel a sudden rush of alertness, even before your conscious mind weighs on the possibility of what might be going on. A small region in your brain, known as the hypothalamus, releases hormones that stimulate those two little glands, pituitary and adrenal glands, to pump chemicals through your body. Your sympathetic nervous response, that midbrain, is the fight or flight part. Adrenaline and cortisol trigger immune cells to secrete messenger molecules that whip up your immune response. Your pulse drums under your skin, you're lying there listening, the hair on the surface of your arm stands up, muscles tighten, your body gets charged up to move toward it or run away from it. 
and your hypervigilance to that sound tunes out everything except sounds of immediate threat. Then you recognize those footsteps as your teenager bro coming up the steps after finishing his midnight bowl of cereal. He pops his head in, sees your face and says, it's all good, mom. Now we got the parasympathetic response. Your body relaxes, your muscles loosen, the hair on your arms flattens back down, your hyperthalamus as well as your pituitary and adrenaline. We call it the HPA stress axis. Hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. Everybody calms down. And then after the stressful event, your body dampens down your fight or flight response, you recover, return to a baseline place of rest and recovery. So the parasympathetic system is key to regulating our emotional distress. Our facial expression, tone of voice, body language are all right brain indicators of information and critical components to what Dan Siegel refers to as our interpersonal neurobiology, our brain's capacity to affect and be affected by others' brains. It's key to our healing that we have others in, we, in our lives that see and respond to these signals. If you are not able to engage your parasympathetic system, then your dorsal vagal system kicks in and we have dissociation. Dissociation due to threat and trauma can include distorted sense of time, detached feeling that you're almost observing uh, what's happening to you, like a movie, like it's unreal, or in extreme cases, uh, children withdraw into elaborate fantasy world and you get sort of this, um, what you've probably heard of as, as dissociative personality where they can actually even create separate personalities in order to be safe. Now, after a normal stressful event, your body dampens down, again, that fight or flight response, your system recovers, you go back to rest and recovery. And for most children and adults, the adaptive response to an acute trauma, you know, a threat, car accident, right, involves a mixture of hyperarousal and then dissociation. Leaving the body is a natural survival mechanism. And in less amounts, you see it in daydreaming and in trauma, when we lose this, we're triggered automatically, we lose control of our ability to stay present in the face of something that frightens us even as adults, okay? So what happens if early on, I didn't develop the ability to engage others as part of my parasympathetic system or find ways to be able to soothe myself, now when I get triggered, I leave my body, which also means I'm not in the present and I'm not able to connect with the people in my world around me in order to calm down. Okay, now let's talk about our normal immune system. Let's say your immune system has to fight a viral or bacterial infection. Lots of white blood cells charge to the site of the infection. Those white blood cells secrete inflammatory cytokines to help destroy the infiltrating pathogens and repair damaged tissues. However, when those cytokines aren't well regulated, or become too great in number, rather than repair tissue, they cause tissue damage. Motions cause and create the same response as invading by bacteria. When we experience stressful emotions, anger, fear, worry, anxiety, rumination, that HPA axis releases those stress hormones, including cortisol and inflammatory cytokines that promote inflammation. And although humans are designed to rebound from high intensity survival states, we also have the problematic ability to neocortically override the discharge of excess survival energy. So through rationalization, judgment, shame, enculturation, fear of our body sensations, we may disrupt our innate capacity to self-regulate and functionally recycle disabling terror and helplessness. So how does that happen? It means that I stay stuck in that midbrain fight or flight and I'm think about it over and over and over and over again because I can't I can't get into my parasympathetic ability to calm myself down or utilize other people to help me calm down. I get stuck and and I and I have all kinds of defenses and I just keep ruminating there. When the nervous system does not reset after an overwhelming experience, sleep, cardiac digestion, respiration, immune systems uh, function can be seriously disturbed. So 
unresolved physiological distress can lead to other physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms. More subtle types of tissue damage can happen slowly over time in response to chronic stress. When your system is repeatedly overstimulated, it begins to downshift in response to stress. On the face of it, it might sound like a good thing, like a downshifted stress response should decrease your inflammation, right? But, hang on, Oop, there we go. But remember, the stress response is supposed to react to a big stressor pump into defensive action, recover quickly, and then return back to homeostasis, rest and recovery. The problem is when you have chronic stress, the stress response never shuts off. So you're caught perpetually in that first half, that fight or flight part of the stress cycle. There's no recovery. Instead, the stress response is always mildly on, pumping out low chronic doses of inflammatory chemicals. So the stress glands, the hypothalamus, the HPA axis, secretes low level of stress hormones all the time, which leads to chronic cytokine activity and inflammation, all right? So simply, chronic stress leads to dysregulation of our stress hormones, which leads to unregulated inflammation, and inflammation can lead to symptoms and disease. This immune system impact is why there's um, a significant link between individuals who experience chronic stress and significantly higher levels of inflammation and disease. Okay, so we're going to stop uh, at this point. This is part one. Part two, we're going to take on the neurobiology of attachment and relationships. Okay, but now that we finish this part, I'm going to have you pause, then I'm going to have you watch the video link. I've created, um, it's a National Geographic uh, stress, a video with Robert Sapowski. Okay, it's really marvelous. I love it. So, and you will have questions from it on your quiz. Okay, so you need to watch it, but you'll love it and it won't be a hardship, okay? And then I will be then uh, talking to you, let me stop share, be talking to you with part two um, afterwards when you've had a chance to take a look at the video, okay?